We didn't, we didn't practice getting up. No. <laughs> so uh, I want to thank Adam for inviting me to um, engage in this conversation with my good friend Brian Hooks. I'm an unlikely moderator in this crowd. Um, and I have to wear the jacket to show it, so I always. <laughs> um, so Brian Hooks and I first met in 2009. I was a creative director at Spike TV, which no longer exists, but was the network for men. And um, again, makes me the some, perfect some person men. to do this. And, uh, and I, had, uh, I had reached out to a fellow at the Mercatus Center, which Brian had run at the time, but I didn't even know it was a thing. Uh, Russ Roberts, because I wanted to make a video about the economy and the, the boom and bust, what, what Adam had referred to that his son liked so much. And, uh, and after getting to know uh, uh, Russ, Russ said, well, you need to meet Brian, who heads the organization. He's a great guy, and, and, um, and you know, he's going to be helping us raise money and, and you know, generate outreach for, the, for this project. And so I met with Brian at Pastis, a restaurant in the meatpacking district. And if any of you know Brian Hooks, you know he has very good taste. <laughs> um, and one of the things along the way in the conversation, uh, he said is, you know, are you familiar with Charles Koch? This is 2009, and I was a pretty politically minded person, and I didn't know who Charles Koch was. I'd never heard the name. And and so it's interesting that later, more recently, Brian has now become the president of the Charles Koch Foundation and Institute and the chairman of the Seminar Network. And so I really want to start with this question for Brian. Brian, what is the Seminar Network? What, you know, and, and what's Charles' role in this? And you know, tell, tell everybody you know, your, your perspective on sure. it. Sure. Uh, and, and it's an a, a appropriate question given that we're talking about partnerships, because ultimately that is what the Seminar Network is. It's a, a collection, a collaboration between hundreds of business leaders and philanthropists that are working towards common goals. And I'll get into that. Before I get there, I have to correct the record. You mentioned uh, that I have good taste, and I, I hate to run away from a compliment, but truth <laughs> be told, it was your wife, Lisa Versace, your co-founder at Emergent Order, who chose pasties. So Lisa's <laughs> the one with the good taste. And I will say, uh, just to get a plug in for you, John, uh, what John has done since making that first Keynes v. Hayek video, which is a, a fun story to share about how that actually got done while you were at Spike, you've brought uh, a passion for storytelling and a real professionalism that has helped so many of the organizations that so many of, of the people in this room support today just to be so much more effective. So thank you for what you're doing. And I think it's been, yeah, it's been uh, something that has been persuasive and more and more people have followed your lead, which I think is great. It's allowed us to connect with a whole lot more people. So cheers to you. Thanks, uh, thanks for the plug, Brian. Yeah, it's always good to plug the guy that's, yeah, that's been brilliant. But. So the Seminar Network, many people in this room are part of the Seminar Network. And to tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll talk till I'm blue in the face and tell you what we do. Let me tell you why we do what we do. Uh, and, and I think it's very much in the spirit of the reason that the Philanthropy Roundtable uh, has invited all of us here today. As a, as a network of organizations, uh, as, a, as the Charles Koch Foundation, we start from a deep belief in the power of human potential to address even the hardest problems. The story that Jonah told about this hockey stick of human history is a great illustration of, uh, of why we have that, that premise and why we start from this idea that to the extent that people are free to realize their potential and innovate and discover new and better ways to do things, we are all going to be OK, uh, no matter what the world throws at us. But there's a couple of things that are important to, to know about that, and it kind of gets into why we've organized this, the, ourselves the way that we have and why we're addressing some of the issues that we are. And when I say we believe in the power of human potential to solve problems, we're not talking about the potential of just a few people. Right, Jonah mentioned that there's a, a theory out there, a tribal, one, one of the strains of tribalism that talks about how, really, let's just leave it to the experts. And that, that never works very well. Right? The story of human history really is uh, the story of bringing more and more people in, into the institutions that facilitate human progress. And so we believe that all people have the ability to contribute if they're given the opportunity. And so the opportunity, the, the chance for philanthropy to identify the barriers that are holding people back and really begin to uh, unleash that human potential to solve all sorts of problems is why we do what we do and ultimately uh, why we've organized ourselves the, the way that we have. And if you know Charles Koch, you, you understand that this makes sense. The guy's an engineer. He's got three degrees from MIT. Uh, he's spent his life trying to understand how the world works. And as he's learned how, that, how different principles that characterize 
human progress. He's applied those in a company that has become one of the most successful in, in the world. To give you a sense, you know, Coke Industries, when Charles took over uh, since the 60s until now, has grown 6,000-fold, right? So not too bad. Not 6,000%, as he always reminds me when I share that. 6,000-fold, <laughs> right? Uh, and the way that he's done it is by uh, identifying ways in which he can uh, unleash the potential of his employees within the company to create value for the company and share in that value themselves. And so it's those print that, that same approach that we try to take in the philanthropy of the Charles Koch Foundation and then in the broader strategies of the seminar network, which ultimately, as I say, is uh, a broad partnership with hundreds of uh, donors and, and partners and ultimately thousands of individuals and different organizations that are all working towards this, this goal of really unleashing human potential so that we can see what new extraordinary things people can accomplish going forward. Um, I, you know, I've, uh, I've read Charles's book, uh, The Science of Success, which was the geekier one. That's right. So I'm, I'm proud, proud of that. Um, you know, this vision for unleashing people's potential is such a huge, I mean, essentially it's an all-encompassing vision. And um, Charles and his, and we talk, that, we talk about this a lot, that he's, as an engineer and as someone who looks at systems, he tries to break down problems in, in a kind of systematic way. Mm -hmm. So can you go a little deeper into what that means uh, tangibly? How do you try to tackle this? Um, you talk about institutions, you talk about issues, but break down for right. me what are these barriers and what are sort of the ways that you are trying to uh, attack them and, and, and tear them down or, or provide support? Sure, so the problems that all of us are trying to address are complex problems. And so they need comprehensive solutions, right? There's no silver bullet one approach, wish there was, we haven't found it yet, that's gonna address some of the most complex problems that are really standing in the way of people realizing their potential. And so the way that we've organized our operation, our network, to address that problem of complexity is to think about the barriers that exist across the key institutions of society. It's a fancy way of, say, of saying basically, what are those things, those areas of society that are essential for people to either make their success or, or break their success? And we simplify that as education, communities, uh, the institution of business, and then public policy or government. Uh, these are the institutions, right? If they're working well, you've got access to a quality education, you've got strong communities that can be your support system, you've got principal businesses that are providing jobs and helping to uh, add to rather than detract from the culture, which is a big problem these days. Uh, and you've got sound public policy that provides an environment for people to have opportunity and succeed. For the most part, people are gonna do well. And, and Jonah gave us a nice uh, illustration of what doing well looks like for uh, the vast majority of, of people who have lived through the last couple of hundred years. The, um, the challenges come and the barriers that we need to address come when those institutions break down. And so when we see barriers that are preventing people from, holding, from realizing their potential, we don't look for a silver bullet. We look, what, are, what, what role can these institutions play in helping to tear down those barriers? Quick example, if I might. Um, uh, Rebecca mentioned criminal justice reform. A, a, a broken criminal justice system is one of these barriers that is standing in the way of people realizing their, their best life. And the, the challenge there is complex. There are uh, hundreds of groups that are doing good work on this. Pew is, is one of them. I have to uh, give a, a whole lot of credit to the work that Rebecca has done. And she mentioned the critical role that data plays in, this, in, in all conversations, but this one in particular. There is so much misinformation out there about our criminal justice system, and Pew is doing just a phenomenal job of making sure that we've got the facts to ground the conversation uh, to make real progress here. But the challenge of the criminal justice system, lots of different ways to understand how broken it is. One is our recidivism rate. Right? The recidivism rate is the likelihood that when somebody gets out of prison, they will come back into prison sometime within the next three to five years. And it's measured in different ways, but it's, and some, some people will tell you nationally on average it's about 60%, some people will tell you it's 70%. Regardless, it's way too high. And so there are lots and lots of groups that are working to address this challenge, to break down this barrier in society. One of them, uh, one of my favorites that we support through an organization called Stand Together, uh, is, is called Hudson Link. And Hudson Link employs this comprehensive approach in just a really elegant way, started by a guy who spent 17 years in Sing Sing in New York uh, for a crime that he did commit. And uh, Sean, his the guy who started this, 
uh, learned when he was there that there are a lot of people in prison uh, that had they gone down the right path edu edu educationally, they would be in a very different position. And so when he got out, he started Hudson Link, which is a, a degree granting program for uh, men and women who are in prison. And they get degrees, as Sean says, not from the University of Sing Sing, but from Columbia University and other uh, very good colleges. Uh, so education is a critical way that Hudson Link addresses this problem of recidivism. But it's not enough. Because when these guys and, and women get out, if they've been gone for 10, 15, 20, 30 years, the world has changed a lot. They need strong communities to help them re-enter society. And so Hudson Lake invests in the communities that will be there to help support them. Not enough though, right? We know that the best predictor about, of whether somebody will return to prison after they've gotten out is whether they can get and keep a job. And so Hudson Lake works as a career placement agency as well. And the people that get out of this program, uh, on average, they get a job within three weeks, which is extraordinary, even if you're not in prison. Uh, but that's, that, even, even all of those things are not enough. If we don't have a public policy environment that is conducive to welcoming people back into society, you know, for instance, a policy system that doesn't restrict access to employment, say, through unnecessary occupational licensure, then it's going to be very hard for people to succeed. Or my favorite, if, if you've got a public policy that bans programs like Hudson Lang, which for a long time we did, and in some places we still do, you know, it's just very counterproductive. And so the punchline here is Hudson Link, for those people that go through their program, they don't recidivate at, at, at 70 or 60 percent. The recidivism rate for Hudson Link graduates is 1 percent. And so a comprehensive approach like this, it's complex. It, it's, it, it takes all sorts of partnerships to really affect that. But if we can employ that across all of these different problems in society, we've got a fighting chance to make a difference. So you, in some ways, you, you have a sort of cross-sectional matrix, right? Because you have this set of issues, uh, and you've got these institutions. So uh, you listed the institutions, but there, there's some other issues that I think are pretty surprising for people that might come cold and to the Koch network. And, and the, the two that I, I think are especially interesting is your, is your area of um, you know, American poverty which obviously criminal justice reform plays a big role in, uh, but, but also education. And, and so you touch on both of those with um, Hudson Link, but can you elaborate on some of the other areas where in education and poverty you're making investments that you think are impactful and different? Sure, yeah, so I mentioned that we invest across these, these four different uh, institutions in society. Hudson Link's a great example of what I would consider to be helping to strengthen uh, the overall community uh, programs, programs that are, are aimed at addressing causes of persistent poverty. Uh, say a word about education, which so many people in this room uh, have so much more experience in than I do. So a lot of what I'll, I'll share is lessons that we've learned in partnership with many of you. Um, you know, we look at the purpose of education uh, as threefold, really. Uh, first, to help students and people better understand who they are, what their aptitudes are, where they're passionate, uh, where they want to spend their, their life. Um, what they wanted to spend their life doing. Uh, the second, second role is to uh, help develop the skills around those aptitudes uh, that will uh, cause them to create value in society. And the third is to uh, get some practice applying those skills to actually create value for others and then sharing that value for themselves. And when students and people get access to those three dimensions of education, they tend to develop into the kinds, kinds of people that can handle whatever's thrown at them. And this is so critical these days, right, with the pace of change and all that. When they don't get access to that, it's very hard for people to succeed. And so the network that we work with supports um, uh, a whole lot of programs in, say, K through 12, that are aimed at providing that kind of quality, three-dimensional education to students and to remove the barriers that are standing in people's way. Quick example on that front. There's a, a group here. Uh, that we support called OpenStax, which is a project of Rice University in Houston. And, and I know there's a handful of people in this room, at least a handful, who have partnered, or we've partnered with, to support this, this program. OpenStax is a, a digital learning platform that will ultimately make textbooks obsolete. And the reason this is important is that we learned as we started looking at this opportunity is that the price of a textbook, the price of a textbook, uh, can be a major factor in a student's decision to pursue a certain direction in education or in a school's decision to what even, even to offer a certain course like AP U.S. History. And so imagine that. I mean, that the, the reason that you as somebody don't pursue your passions and really fully develop as a person is because of a $150 textbook. And it happens to, to way too many people. 
So OpenStax basically makes the marginal cost of the textbook zero to the student and to the teacher. Uh, and it breaks down that barrier and helps them to really kind of realize that, that educational direction. And when it comes to higher education, this is an area where we focus a whole lot of our time and resources. Um, about two thirds of the uh, resources that come from the seminar network and all of the, the donors that we work with are invested in education and community programs with the rest going to public policy and then a very small amount going to, to politics, which I, I hope we'll get a chance to talk about. Yep. But the universities uh, you know, have, have got to remain a place where the ideas and the talent that will lead the country forward are fostered and, and generated. And so we have a very uh, significant commitment to helping uh, enable the faculty members and the students in universities of really realizing that kind of a three-dimensional education there. We're invested in about 350 different universities, over 1,000 faculty members and programs at those, those schools. Schools, uh, you know, University of Chicago, Harvard, Stanford, Columbia, uh, historically black colleges and universities through our partnerships with UNCF and, and the Thurgood Marshall College Fund, uh, state schools like University of Michigan where I went, <laughs> community colleges, sort of the whole gamut. Uh, and the programs that we invest in are as diverse, everything from criminal justice work to foreign policy to technology and innovation to economics and, and entrepreneurship. And, and all of those, the one common thread is we're looking to help enable the faculty and the students to realize who they are and develop the skills and the experience and applying those skills in a way that can help uh, benefit society, uh, create value for others and then share in some of that value. Um, there's all sorts of great examples. I'm gonna pick on one, um, if you'll let me give, give one more example. This is a program, again, that we discovered based on partnership with, uh, with Tom Smith, uh, some, someone who's been just a phenomenal philanthropist and somebody that we've learned a lot from. Uh, but this is a program at Brown University we've been supporting for the past 10 years. Uh, a guy named John Tomasi, who's just a phenomenal individual, uh, somebody who truly believes in this notion of three-dimensional education. He runs a program that he calls the Janus Forum. Many of you maybe are familiar with this. And what John does is he empowers students to bring speakers uh, of very different perspectives together and have a uh, rigorous and spirited but civil discussion on very controversial issues. And he does it on the campus of Brown. And the purpose of this, and this is important, is not to persuade people that they were wrong when they came into that conversation, but it's to demonstrate to people that no matter how passionately you feel about something, we have something to learn from those with whom we disagree. And the experience for the students, beyond learning something about uh, an important issue, is extraordinary because the students are the ones that, that put this on. And John's only requirement for who can participate in, in the, the governance of this organization is that you're a registered, uh, you're registered student group with the university. And so what happens is you've got this wide diversity of perspectives and students who are fired up about their particular university group. And in the course of this exercise, they learn how to work with people with whom they disagree, you know, an invaluable skill for going forward. So that's, that's the kind of thing that we like to do when it comes to, to university. And to, to, to jump off from that, and I want to make sure we also get to the, some of the political issues, so we should, um, if you could sort of briefly expand on this notion of unlikely collaboration. You know, it started with the discussion of the work with Pew Char Charitable Trusts, um, but you've also uh, branched out in some very interesting ways. So in criminal justice reform, I know you've even worked with Van Jones mm -hmm. um, as, as, as an influencer that's been involved in that. You've, uh, uh, Charles has, has, has penned articles on immigration with Tim Cook from Apple. Um, Dion Sanders has worked with the Stand Together group, uh, working on poverty alleviation programs in Dallas. Uh, you know, what sort of, what drives these unlikely collaborations? What, what, is, there a, is there a strategic component to it? Is it, is it, is it about learning? Like, like, why does that, why has that become such an important focus for, for the network? So the answer is yes, right? All of, all of the above, and I'll echo what Rebecca said. I mean, we don't accomplish anything um, outside of our partnerships with, with a wide range of people. Um, you know, we follow uh, Frederick Douglass's mantra. In fact, this is the, the quote that is on the conference room outside of my office at the Koch Foundation, so we, we remind ourselves of it every day, and that is that we will unite with anyone to do right and with no one to do wrong. And when you have that perspective and you come into conversations with people that you may disagree with them on 90% of the issues, 
But when you can have a genuine conversation and really take the time, and Rebecca made this point well, I think, to just put it all on the table and no pretense and really uh, open yourself up to search for whether or not we have complementary capabilities and share some common ground, I mean, incredible things can happen. So you mentioned Dion. Uh, yeah. I grew up in the 90s. He was a big deal in the 90s, uh, he's a Hall of Famer. Uh, he's become a great partner over the last couple of years. He's working with us on a, on a project in Dallas, a portfolio of organizations that are addressing different causes of persistent poverty. And the groups that we're working with are great examples of this unlikely collaboration as well. Right. Dion introduced us uh, to a number of folks in the group called Urban Specialists. This is a group that was uh, co-founded by a pastor and a former gang leader, a guy named Anton Lucky, who started the Bloods yep. in Dallas. You've met Anton. Extraordinary guy. He's got all sorts of skills. He was just applying them to, to the wrong end. He's an entrepreneur. He's an entrepreneur. So. Uh, and and, and he, uh, he had a huge impact in Dallas, and now he's working to, to have a different kind of impact. But these guys go into uh, high schools and to middle schools. And if you want to know how effective Urban Specialist is, just imagine that. Public school superintendents are inviting uh, felons, formerly incarcerated people, into their schools to be with their children. They've they got to be good at what they do. Uh, and what they do is they put their arm around the 10% of the kids that cause all the trouble in the schools, and they say, hey, don't make the same mistakes I did and they provide support for them on a day-to-day -day basis. And this has a tremendous impact on that 10%, but it also creates a learning environment for that not the other 90%. And so these schools tend to excel after these guys go in. But you want to solve gang violence, you want to solve uh, violence in schools, you got to go and work with former gang leaders, right? We work with a group called uh, the Phoenix, which is a peer-to-peer -peer physical fitness group that um, addresses addiction in the, in the midst of this opioid crisis, we're looking for any solutions that, that we can find that exceed the average. These guys have recovery rates that are twice the, uh, the best clinical programs. But it's run by a guy, yeah, Scott, uh, Strode. A, Scott Strode, who was a former addict, right? He knows what, what works with folks. Uh, and so you gotta open yourself up to knowledge from unlikely places, and these are the partnerships that are extraordinary. I, I shared the story of uh, Hudson Link a second ago, Sean Pika, um, as I mentioned, he's a formerly in incarcerated uh, guy. He spent 17 years in jail for a, a heinous crime. Um, but you want to work to, to reduce the recidivism rate, work with a guy who knows what's important to people who are in prison. And, and this, of course, extends to our philanthropic partnerships as well. Uh, we've been uh, very fortunate to work with Pew. We've been uh, fortunate to work with uh, folks at the Democracy Fund, for instance, the Knight Foundation. Um, and many, many others who, yeah, you, you sit back and, and you learn uh, and you realize that you, both, you don't have to agree on everything, but you bring uh, important information to the table, you're stronger together. I mean, it's very consistent in so many ways with Charles's concepts and market-based management and just the sense that knowledge is local and it's particular to time and place and somebody that's engaged in an issue at a local level is just going to know tactically and strategically so much more than where you might think theoretically you are at in your offices in DC. So I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, if you, you ever walk into a meeting with Charles Koch thinking you have all the answers, you learn real fast that you're wrong. <laughs> and so <laughs> you, get, you get in a good habit of, uh, of listening. I, um, so the, the, the elephant in the room whenever you're talking about Charles Koch or the Koch Foundation or the Seminar Network is the brand that you didn't create but that emerged, which is the Koch Brothers. And uh, the Koch Brothers as uh, partisan, conservative, industrialist, Republican kingmakers, and we're in this That's incredibly, well <laughs> and we're in this incredibly polarized age, right? Where, um, you know, in some respect, the Coke brand is very deeply tied into that, and it doesn't seem to connect that story with the story you're telling here today. And so, uh, talk to me about how. You, you know, working inside the organization and working with Charles, how, how are you grappling with this reality? How are you changing the nature of the investments and the strategy of the network in the face of this public narrative? Because it obviously has impacts on the kind of collaborations sure. that you would have with folks like Rebecca at Pew and others that might be, like, frankly, weary to, or leery to engage with uh, the network. Yeah, no, that's right. So. You know, Charles Koch's been a philanthropist for almost 60 years, 55 years. And for 45 of those years, he really had nothing to do with politics. 
Right? His first passion was education. That's, as I said, where the bulk of his resources go. Um, and then uh, and some public policy uh, in, in there as well along the way. In uh, about 10 years ago, right? so right after we met, you mentioned right. that in 2009 you hadn't heard of Charles Koch. Very few people had. 10 years ago, he said, look, uh, if we want to make more progress in advancing good, sound public policy, we got to get engaged in politics. And boom, all of a sudden, everybody knows who Charles Koch is. And look, I don't, I don't blame uh, the media for publishing headlines that people want to read, right? When you, it's the business model. It's a business model, right? I mean, and, and certainly we have not done a good job of telling the, the story of the, the, the true story of the investment portfolio and the purpose for what we do. Um, but if you look at the actions, you know, I think it, it bears it out. So our North Star, as I said, has always been how do we identify and remove the barriers that are preventing from people from realizing their potential. Public policy plays an important role both in facilitating success but also in creating barriers. You want to change public policy, politicians have something to do with that, you get involved in politics. But that's always been our North Star. It's never been about partisan republicanism. Uh, in fact, we, we founded the Seminar Network in 2003 when George Bush was president, and, and it was largely in response to what we saw as, uh, as bad decisions when it came to the growth of government and spending, uh, tariffs on, on the steel industry, well, here we are again, uh, and the war in Iraq, you know, under a Republican president. So it wasn't personal about George Bush, it was, look, we care about these barriers. Um, and that's really, uh, I think, surprising for people who think that, well, 2010 lines up with the Obama administration, and so, of course, you guys get in you know, get involved then. We have, a, we have a good way of offering advice to just about every president. <laughs> uh, but the purpose here was, let's see if we can make or help to facilitate better public policy. And when we got involved in politics about 10 years ago, we did it like everybody else did, and we have since then. And the way you do politics, I don't have to tell many of you who are, who are more experienced than I am at this, is you bet on a team, and you try to optimize a policy agenda within uh, what that team says that they're capable of doing. So Republicans, you take everything that they give you, Democrats, you take everything that, you, that they give you, and you try to do your best that you can within those constraints. You go for partisan majorities. But I think anybody who's been engaged in politics for the, the reasons that we have to achieve better public policy has to take a real honest look at that and say, that's not working very well for anybody. And so we were always engaged for policy reasons, not partisan reasons. We're not achieving policy at a rate that's acceptable. So we're doing things differently now. And we are, we are going to do things drastically differently going forward. We're not looking for partisan majorities anymore in terms of achieving public policy. We're looking for policy majorities. And we want to work with anybody, Republicans or Democrats, who are serious about getting good policy done. Basically advancing policy that is seriously going to improve people's lives. So when I say this, in a room full of people who have, have worked with us for a while, they get a little nervous, and that's understandable. You're going to support Democrats now. Absolutely. To the extent that Democrats do the right thing, we would absolutely welcome uh, a conversation with, with any Democrat, any Republican. So people get nervous when I say that, but here's the, here's the fun part about this. We've been doing this for the past nine or ten months, and it's working. It's working in an extraordinary way. So conventional wisdom is that in an election year, in a midterm election year, Basically, you pass a budget, maybe just a budget resolution, you get out of town, you campaign. Kiss good public policy goodbye in an election year. This election year, with the support and the partnership of dozens of people, both Republicans and Democrats, different outside groups that, that tend to affiliate either way, our network has helped to drive extraordinary policy change, uh, despite that conventional wisdom. A couple of quick examples. Right to try. This is a, an issue that I think many, many people in this room have been invested in for a long time. And uh, up until January of this year, it looked like it might have a chance at the federal level. This is the ability of terminally ill uh, patients to get uh, access to experimental treatments. But as of January, it's an election year, basically the House and the Senate put down their pens and said, we're not doing anything on this this year. There was nothing in it for them politically. So we, along with the other groups, got together and said, well, let's make, it, make something in, in it for you politically. Basically, if you don't act on this very important legislation, there will be costs to pay. And lo and behold, right to try passes, right? Extraordinary. We see similar things on criminal justice reform. And this is a, a great example of uh, 
of people from all different perspectives coming together just to get some sensible reform passed despite the odds. So uh, in, in uh, the spring, the House passes the First Step Act, a modest first step <laughs> towards prison reform uh, by, a mar by, by about 362 votes. 362 people voted for this, this law. And this is a, an extraordinary achievement by many people in this criminal justice community, among them Van Jones, former Clinton admin, uh, Obama administration official, and Hakeem Jeffries, a congressman from New York, a Democratic congressman from New York. And people came together. Why did they do it? I think it's because people like you participated and said, you know what, we got your back. If you do the right thing, regardless of whether it's going to upset your partisan associates, we got your back. And so anyway, we're really excited about the prospects of this approach. And again, our North Star has never changed. Good public policy that helps people to improve their lives. The, the tactics to achieve that, you've got to be willing to uh, admit when something is not going as well as it needs to and do something different. I think, and we only have a, a few minutes left, but so as a last question, Adam teed this up, that, that both of these conversations with um, this concern around polarization, which really cuts to the heart of what you were talking about, about how do you generate that policy majority when we're playing a skins versus shirts game, and you can decide whether which side has skins and which side has shirts. <laughs> um, and you're saying, well, I'm going to wear a, a bikini then, so I'm halfway there. I mean, how do you, how do you as Coke and as the network um, try to use your outsized influence to make a difference in polarization? And I think this is especially an interesting question for you, given that you know, the Coke brand pu in public narrative is, um, is highly partisan, for, for better or for worse, at the moment. So how, how do you see this challenge as somebody who's got a big stake in this? I just want to acknowledge that everybody in this room is now looking at us in bikinis, so that's a little <laughs> awkward, but... <laughs> you can uh, visualize it, it's okay. Well, look, it's not going to happen overnight. And I think everybody who is committed to this sort of an approach, and I, and I include uh, many people in this room who we've worked with and learned from, um, we've got to recognize that this is about building trust. And so, you know, take a risk on what we say, but judge us by what we do. Uh, and we're committed to seeing this through in a very, very serious way. You know, the, the vision that I described of our network, uh, the notion that we, we, when we remove barriers that are preventing people from realizing their potential, um, they will accomplish extraordinary things. The way that they'll do that is by creating value uh, for themselves by helping others to succeed, this notion of mutual benefit, which is in direct contrast to what Jonah talked about, uh, the trend towards tribalism. For me to win, you got to lose. And so I think the more that we can learn from the partnerships that we've engaged in, the more that um, people like, like those here today will continue to partner together and with us, um, I think the greater an example that we can set. And look, most people want to do the right thing. Uh, and it's risky and, and sometimes it's hard to, but the example I think that, that you all set, that the philanthropists who are committed to this vision set, um, is a powerful example and people will come along. And, and they already are in a number of different ways. So we're very committed to this notion of civility, of partnership, and of, uh, as Rebecca said, acknowledging our differences which are important, but also acknowledging that uh, as many differences we have, we have much, much more in common uh, than otherwise. Well, for all the challenges that uh, we face as a country, it's just exciting to hear that an organization that's got so much impact, like the Seminar Network, is trying to take them on in a spirit of unity. And uh, so, you know, on behalf of everybody, I want to thank you, Brian, for participating in this conversation. Thanks, John. Thank you.